morning, church family. You know, I purposely start off the service by saying, Good morning, church family, because that is indeed what God intends for us to be a family. And, you know, that's a biblical concept, but that is a very real concept, having been a member, my family and I, for this congregation for the last four years. And, you know, one of the difficult things of life as a minister, and by the way, it is true to those who are invested on the congregation's front as well, is for changes to happen. I don't want to sit here and fool myself into thinking that I'm more important than I am because I certainly am not. The church is bigger than one person. Uh, that's true of every congregation. That's true of the church universally. And um, the, only reason I make, the only reason I address the congregation in the fashion that I'm going to for the next five minutes or so before I jump into the lesson is because after hearing the various comments and after hearing the various um, messages that have been sent my way and my family's way over the past six weeks or so, I feel compelled to address the congregation in a positive way because, um, you know, my instinct is just to preach a regular sermon and go away and try to keep in touch. But uh, your words of encouragement have touched me in a way that is kind of surprising. Not surprising because of who they're coming from, but surprising at... just surprising. I don't know how to say it. And... Um, I want you to know that me and my family love this congregation. I know we've only been here four years, but we love this congregation. And it is not easy to leave this congregation and go and work at another church that we are determined and are planning on retiring at. And uh, to know this is the last congregation that I moved from, if the Lord wills, uh, it, is a, it is a memorable thing, but it is a touching thing. I didn't plan anything to say because I wanted to speak from the heart and give me five or seven minutes to address us, this being my last sermon here on a Sunday morning. Um, and then we'll get into the lesson. You know, I love this congregation. I love what this congregation represents. I love the way that you and, and this congregation treated me and my family. Just a little bit of background um, that maybe I haven't shared too much, and that is when we came to the Lake City Church of Christ... There were, there were some struggles that we had and some brokenness that we experienced just through church work uh, beating us up a little bit. And we moved here right at the beginning of the pandemic, almost at the beginning, in July, the end of July 2020. And when we arrived to a new church family, that is not the typical way you would arrive. Number one, feeling a little bit beat up, feeling a little bit discouraged, um, feeling a little bit uh, untrusting and having a guard up because of some of the things that we had gone through and experienced. And I say that even though we left a wonderful congregation before, it was more individual based. And I want you to know from, just from my heart, that number one, and let me just say it like it is, the first year or two was not easy for me here. It was not easy because one, we moved in the middle of a pandemic, and there, there are some unique challenges to that, as you would recall. And number two, the baggage that we were bringing emotionally into the situation. And, and the only way you can really start a church work off right is immediately be in people's homes and immediate, immediately start to get to know people and immediately really emphasize relationships, which is the way we've always tried to do it. And the pandemic put a big, uh, you know, a big difficulty there in our path as far as that was concerned. And so... But I will tell you, these last two, even the last three years, has been beautiful in a lot of ways for us because you have been a loving congregation. You have been an easy congregation to work for. Sure, y'all kept me busy. It's all get out. But, um, you know, I tell other preacher friends of mine that I do four lessons a week, and they tell me they do two. And, and I just think about that with your future ministers. I'll just tell you that. <laughs> but easy from the standpoint that everybody was a Christian lady and a Christian gentleman. Uh, when there was differences, we were able to talk about those and work through those. Uh, you would often give me the benefit of the doubt, and when you did not, you allowed me to explain myself. You endured the teaching of what I've done my best to be sound teaching from the Scriptures. You have accepted not only the easy-to-listen-to lessons, but the challenging lessons and the hard-to-listen-to lessons. 
I would have elders of our congregation who would come to me very, very frequently after a very challenging or difficult lesson, or Bible class for that matter, talking about difficult subjects, and say, good job, keep preaching the truth, best I've heard on it, and just keep me uplifted after a Bible class was challenging. Because let's face it, I also know preachers who say they refuse to teach auditorium Bible classes because they're notorious for being difficult. It's my favorite part of church work. It's my absolute favorite part of church work. And I'm going to be blunt with you. If you're not showing up to the, uh, auditor or to the Bible classes for various ages, um, uh, you're missing out on probably some of the best stuff the church produces here, in my opinion. And I think you should consider being a part of that. I run the risk of rambling a little bit, but I just want you to know that we love you. We appreciate that we could come here and be a part of the family. We could be ourselves. I could be in the office with a ball cap on and shorts, and you didn't think a thing of it. I got in the last year showing up to a hospital visit in a ball cap and shorts, and nobody thought much of it. They might look down at my skinny chicken legs, and they would look at that. <laughs> But um, you allowed us to be ourselves. You gave us four years of healing. We built some wonderful friendships and relationships here. There are some absolutely wonderful godly servants here that rivals, that, 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 that no congregation I can think of would rival. We may not be the largest congregation that you know of, but I promise you this is an impressive congregation. Not that we're perfect, not that we have everything figured out, not that we have any problems we don't need to work through. But this is a wonderful congregation. It's, it's not something I really want to do, but let me just talk where my mind's at for a minute, and then again, we got a lesson plan that we'll get to. You know, I kept up. I, I was contacted by Bud in January or so of 2020, and so it wasn't until June before I met you guys. So from January all the way until the pandemic, I was keeping up with the services here. The average attendance was about 130-ish uh, in attendance. We, we say, and I'm not saying it's attributed to me, it's attributed to this congregation. We sat here having gone through a pandemic, having gone through some changes, and we're averaging, of course, it's summertime right now where people are traveling, but we're averaging in the 160s most Sundays. Um, that is a growth. I can beat the pulpit and look down on the congregation and tell you how sorry we are at evangelism, or I can just speak the truth. There are some of the most evangelically geared minds I have ever seen in a local congregation right here. There are ladies who feed those who are in need. There are members, ladies and men alike, who make regular visits to the hospitals. There are people talking to visitors. We have grown by 30 or 35 members in the past four years. Even with a pandemic, every church I know of lost members. We almost immediately had more attendance after the pandemic than we did before. You know, we, the eldership has been grown. We hired a full-time youth minister that's doing a wonderful job. The congregation loves our youth, emphasizes our youth, and doesn't have a varsity and JV team. They'll put kids right up here in the middle of service and use them and show them that they're a part of the church as anybody is. These are wonderful blessings the Lake City Church of Christ has brought into our life. And I see some visitors here this morning. It can bring into your life as well if you will give them a chance. There's some wonderful people here, and I could ramble, and I don't want to list names, but you serve, you serve under a very, very wonderful eldership. They are godly-minded, they are biblically focused, and they want to do what's right, and they are doing what's right. Work with them, give them the benefit of the doubt, continue to be patient with them, and that goes for the deacons and their families as well. Probably have more to say, but I also want to preach a sermon, so I'm going to jump into the sermon if that's okay. I'll probably regret not saying some things that I couldn't think of at the moment, so I hope you'll understand. But this congregation means the world to us. We'll be leaving behind some wonderful friends and, and brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, some of the best years of our life are right here. So thank you for giving us this opportunity. By the way... Um, the opportunity, you've given me the opportunity to do what I love most in this world, which is preach the gospel. And yes, there were times that I might have been timid about it, overly concerned about what people thought, and I, thought, I think you picked up on that on occasion. But especially in the past two years, you've allowed me to be myself and preach the truth, and, and if it wasn't the truth, you challenged me on that. 
But I've done my best to preach the truth, and one thing I can say about the Lake City Church of Christ, if you're considering being a member here, is they are absolutely 100% wholeheartedly committed to having the Bible be their standard for everything they do. And our leadership constantly prays and talks and thinks about that. And whoever it is that comes in here to serve in this capacity in the next, uh, as the next minister, um, I can promise you this, they're going to hire a guy that believes the Bible is where everything starts and finishes, and they're going to try to get somebody to do that. I've had a lot of questions, I'm sure the elders have had even more, about who's coming in next. I'm concerned, what is going to happen? So on and so forth. Well, the longtime members know you don't have to be concerned. You've always hired good preachers here. The newcomers just trust the process. They will bring in a guy who will do his very best to preach the truth. Okay, here's the lesson. I want to put up on the screen a passage that I've been thinking of this week, and that is Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 1. Hebrews 12 and verse number 1. Now I think of this passage in moments of transition and in moments of just encouraging Christians to continue in the faith. And that's really all this passage is, is an encouragement from God's Word in continuing in the faith. You know, as I read this passage, really there is a secular illustration that comes to mind. I'm reminded that in the 1992 Barcelona Olympics, there was a British runner a sprinter actually by the name of Derek Redman. Now this is a pretty well-known story, but maybe you're, you, you need reminding of what happened in, on that occasion. Um, this British sprinter, Derek uh, Redman, he was running the 400 meter race and he was thought by much of the media to be the favorite. A lot of people thought he had a really good shot at winning this race. And, and I was too young to remember it at the time, but I've seen clips and videos of this happening. As they start the race, something tragic happens to the, the sprinter, and that is that his uh, hamstring is torn. And he immediately goes to the ground, and you can see the pain on his face, and he's grabbing at his leg, and he is just overcome with pain. This man who was set to run this 400-meter dash is, uh, is, is now on the ground, the favorite to win it, and everyone just assumes that his race is over. But if you were watching the Olympics on that day, then you may, might recall that something rather beautiful happened. As he was laying there in pain, uh, Derek's father somehow made his way through the security and ran onto the track and grabbed his son and put his son's arm around him and brought him up in a standing position as painful of a tear as he had just experienced. And him and his father began to take steps in the direction of the finish line. And the crowd noticed what was happening, how that his father came out to embrace him. And it was obvious he wasn't going to win any race that day. But the mindset that regardless of how slow I go or how many obstacles are in my way, the idea is I'm going to finish this race. And with his father's help, he limped and he limped and he limped until he crossed the finish line and they got much bigger of an applause from that crowd than the first, second, or third place winner got that day because there was a bigger lesson on display and that is that the important goal in life is to finish the race. The important goal in life is not to quit, it is to, it is to keep on keeping on. It is to continue to head in the direction of the finish line. And the lessons are obvious as we reflect back on the 92 Olympics. In Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2, notice what the Bible says. He says, therefore, by the way, before I read this, let me tell you the context very quickly. The Hebrews writer is writing to, is writing to Jewish Christians. And he's writing to Jewish Christians who are being persecuted. They're being persecuted because of their faith. They are facing prison time and beatings and lashings and land being taken away and ultimately death. They're facing this because of their faith. And in the process of all of this persecution, many of these Jewish Christians are having second thoughts. They're thinking about giving up. They're thinking about not finishing the race. And the Hebrews writer, through the inspiration of God, writes this letter saying, you can't give up. Think about what you're abandoning if you walk away now. And at the end of this letter, throughout this letter, he says Jesus replaces the old law and Jesus' sacrifice is better and His covenant is better and He is a better high priest. Don't give up on Jesus. He's our one and only hope of having salvation in the life to come. At the end of this letter, he says in Hebrews 12, 1, Therefore, 
Therefore, keep that word in mind, because whatever the word therefore is pointing to is directly connected to what is said before it in chapter 11. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There's more to this context, but for sake of time, let's focus on those two verses. He's talking about running a race. He's talking about running a spiritual race. We may call it a, the Christian race. In some observations about this race that he is talking about, number one, he says that we are blessed because... In, in part, we are running in the footprints or footsteps of those who came before us. That's what he means. This is King James language. But in verse number 1 when he says, Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness... There's really what he's saying here is if you go back to chapter 11, which we won't put on the screen, but in your minds and in your Bibles do that. He talks about the faith of Abraham and he talks about the faith of Sarah. He talks about the faith of Moses. He talks about the faith of Enoch even before that. The faith of Isaac and Jacob. He talks about the faith of Noah early on in the chapter. He says, these are men and women of faith. If there was a hall of fame of faith, these are the people that would be in it. People we read of in our Old Testaments who demonstrated their faith. They didn't just claim to have faith. They had faith that could be clearly seen by those around them because they lived according to the will of God. Here's the heroes of faith. He says all of that. And then in chapter 12, verse 1, he said, we're surrounded by them. We're surrounded by their example. They have gone before us. They have ran the race before us. We can know how to run the race because they have showed us how to run the race. And so point number one in this passage is that we are running in the footsteps of those who came before us. People like Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and so on. We're running in their footsteps. They have demonstrated through their lessons in the Old Testament. You know, the Bible says whatever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. We can learn through their example. And you know, there is a sense in which we have uh, heroes in the faith that have left a wonderful legacy for us. This is a faithful congregation of the Lord's people in part, not because of who is presently members here, but because of people who were here in the past. I think of, of course, Brother Harold Herndon that was here and labored as an elder for so many years, and I'm proud to be uh, the last preacher that he hired here as one of the elders. I think of people like that, and the, the, those one, members who have been here for many years, you could start listing the names you can start listing the names of, of not only elders and deacons, but faithful ladies and mothers in the congregation and godly fathers and people who took time to, to, to spend with the youth. And, and you can go on down the list. And, and I understand that any time I come to work with a congregation, I'm building on the progress of the people who came before me, whether that was preachers, elders, deacons, Bible class teachers, or whoever it was. And as I reflect on what the passage is saying here, the idea is not only are we blessed to have wonderful examples who have come before us in the Bible and in our own lives, but we too are building that legacy for the next generation. He says there is this large crowd of witness around us that shows us how to run this race because it is a race. You know, I think in illustration form, the idea of a relay race, you know, that's a little different than a typical race where it's just an individual representing themselves and then their country. A relay race is where you have a group of runners who are running together, let's say four, whether you're talking about runners or swimmers, to carry the analogy, a relay race, if you will, is the idea that they're handing the baton off to the next person. The people of the past have handed the baton off to us. We are working and leaving a legacy of faith ourselves, and we are to hand that baton off to the next generation. And they are to carry that forward. I remember before I even had children, when we were expecting our first child, I would pray this prayer, Lord, please help me to lead my children in the direction of godliness and be preparing for them a faithful godly spouse 
that they will one day have a happy marriage and raise godly children. And Father, please help be preparing for their children a faithful godly spouse so that they can be preparing or working together to raise godly children. And I would do this about four generations down and then I would say, Lord, until you come again, please help those who come from our line, help them to pursue you. That doesn't always work that way in the real world. But it's a goal worth having, isn't it? We understand the things we do, the example we leave, the way we conduct ourselves, the things we teach. It influences the next generation. And I love, one thing I love about this congregation is evangelism. You've always been an evangelistic congregation. Yes, there's a program in place, but you were just as evangelistic the day I arrived. And I love that. Now maybe it's put on more steam as the way it should, and you deserve credit for that. Let me say something, and I hope, it does, and I hope you understand where I'm coming from. Evangelism, good. Biblical, do it. But hear the next thing I say, please, because it's very biblically based. You have an obligation to evangelize your own family before you have an obligation to evangelize everybody, anybody else. The very top of our priority list of people we should be evangelizing should be our spouse, our kids, our grandkids, our nieces and nephews. If I am working and I call myself faithful to Christ in evangelism, but I am not evangelizing or training properly the children or grandchildren in my own life, I need to abandon any other mission that I'm involved in and focus singularly on the home because the church is only as good as our homes are. That's the truth of the matter. The Bible tells me my obligation is more to my wife and to my kids than anybody else. And you know that's biblical. And I think it's worth noting that you can, if you're raising kids, you're an evangelist every single day and that will take up most of your time. That's just the truth of the matter. You're an evangelist every single day and, that's, and that takes up the majority of your time. Do what else you can when you can, but those children get your primary obligation right now and I believe throughout their lives. Now, when it comes to running this race and leaving a legacy, there's much that can be said. But let me just f focus on another point here from verse number 1. Number 1 is running in the footsteps of those who came before us, looking at the example of those in the Great Faith Hall of Fame from Hebrews 11. Learning from those around us, being committed to leave a good legacy for the next generation, putting Christ first and honoring our commitment to the text of Scripture. But point number 2 we would see from verse 1 of Hebrews 12 that we are to be running weight free. And, and you know, another illustration comes to mind. Imagine if I signed up, got approved, and I'm running a race in the Olympics, which you would never see me do. I am not gifted. Now, my DNA thing says that I have the sprinter's gene and I'm a quick runner. Uh, reality says otherwise. Maybe my habits are not what they should. But imagine if I got ready for this race and I start putting on ankle weights and I start putting on a backpack full of supplies and I'm carrying luggage and I try to run the race all weighed down. Am I going to run that race very well? I'm not going to be very fast, which really isn't the point, but I'm not going to last as long as I normally would. He's using this analogy as of a race here, and he says when you get ready to run the race, don't go about running the race being weighed down. And actually, another illustration could come to mind, and it is if you ever have been around many sprinters, especially or runners in general, what do they do before they get ready for the race? They will cut a little bit of weight, not extreme, to diminishes their strength, because if they can just knock off let's say a few pounds, it allows them to be more competitive when they get out there and run the race. They know the importance of shedding unnecessary weight. Here the Bible says that when we are running the Christian race, the idea of course is that we get rid of every weight. Notice the wording of the text. He says, let, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Many of us feel like we are obligated to carry the weight of the world on our shoulders. 
Many people know that our spouse or our children or our neighbors or our elderly family members, they all depend on us and we carry that weight on our shoulders everywhere we go. Many of us feel as though that we have to carry everyone's weight for them. And by the way, church leaders feel this strongly. Mothers feel this strongly. Many fathers feel this strongly. The Bible is talking about weight and then it puts sin in another category, although that's a part of this. Of course, that will never work. If you've lived any life at all, if you've gained any wisdom, you know you will quickly burn out. You will quickly get discouraged. You're far more likely to give up. You're far more likely when the weight makes you hit the ground to just stay there and not finish the race. But if we lay aside the weight that does weigh us down, and especially if we lay aside the sin that especially lays us down, we are more likely to run that race, however slow it may be, and finish the finish the race crossing the finish line. You know that Romans 6.23 tells us the weight of sin is death. It says it this way, the consequences or the wages of sin is death. And we've talked about that in recent lessons, but there is no death like spiritual death. Spiritual death separated from God. Do you remember what Romans 6.23 says next? For the wages of sin is death. What's it say next? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Who is it that can take that weight of, the, of sin and death off of our shoulders? Only Jesus Christ. You know, in that illustration of that man's father coming to lift him up, to help him cross the finish line, our Heavenly Father will help lift us up. Our Heavenly Father will help us bear the weight that we are struggling with. Our Heavenly Father is there to assist us and our Savior Jesus Christ. If we want to persevere and continue in the race, He will help us bear the load. And so don't give up. Don't lose sight. Don't give up. Don't be weighed down is the point. You know, it is difficult sometimes though, isn't it? You know, I go back to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 1. He says, Therefore we also, since we, have, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us. Here's point number 3. And let us run with what? Endurance. The Christian race is not a sprint. The Christian race is not a test to see how fast we are. Thanks to God for that. The Christian race is endurance. Will we last the whole race and not lose sight of the goal? Will we cross the finish line? It's a race of endurance. And, and of course, the idea of it being a race of endurance is pretty clear. You know, in, in the opening story, Derek uh, Redmond, he did not win any medals that day. But he could walk home with the pride of knowing that he got up and he finished. He finished. And some of us have longer Christian journeys than others. My children... I think all three of them became Christians at 10 years of age. My grandmother, my mother's father, my father's mother, became a Christian at the age of 83 and lived three years longer. We don't all have the same journey as far as the longevity of time goes. But the important part is that I stay true to the Lord until my days were over. The important part is that I stay on the track. Did I give up? Did I lose hope is the idea. You know, there's a number of illustrations that come to mind. My wife gave me one the other day. And that is, you know, we were finishing catching up on our reading. We were in separate cars driving to Tennessee and she calls me and says, I got a sermon idea. Now, I said, at least that, that's a good sermon idea, but it might be just a point or an illustration in a sermon for now. You know, we was reading that story in the, in the book of Acts. Later in the book of Acts where Paul is taken prisoner. And he's put on a ship and they're sending him to Rome. And while he's on the ship in the Mediterranean Sea, several days out there is a storm. And the storm is so severe that the men on board of that ship think that they're about to lose their life. You remember that story? And how that when they got so desperate at a certain point that men were even starting to, to try to jump out of the ship. And Paul, through the inspiration of God, says, No, 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 don't jump out of the ship. The God that I serve, He sent an angel to me and told me everything will be alright, but here's the condition. You've got to stay on the ship. 
There will be storms of this life that arise. There will be moments of fear. There will be moments of desperation. There will be times when it's difficult and we want to jump ship. There will be times when we want to abandon the ship and just give up or we may tell ourselves we're taking a break, but that's a clever tool of Satan to get us to take a break and then it becomes harder and harder and harder to get back to the Lord. Don't jump ship because as long as we remain in the ship, as long as we stay on the path of light, as long as we are on this race, running the race, however slow it might be, as long as we know there is an end in sight, we stay on that path and we have the blessings that God has promised. I know life gets tough, but church family, fellow Christians, run the race. Run the race of endurance. Stay on the straight and narrow. Don't lose hope. Don't lose sight. Here's a passage in Isaiah 40, verse 31. I only have a New Testament up here with me, so I'm going to have to read it off the screen. Isaiah 40, and verse number 31. Notice what the Bible says here in Isaiah 40, and verse number 31. I gave her a difficult passage to look up, but here it is. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength... They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You know what this passage is telling us? We have a race to run. We do sometimes get uh, burdened down. We sometimes do get discouraged and we want to give up and not run the race. But the Lord will bless us. He will sustain us. He will give us strength. He can renew our strength so that when we run, we do not get weary. When we walk, we do not faint on this Christian race. The Lord will carry us through. Commit to enduring in your faith journey, relying on God's strength and the community of God's people. Go back to Hebrews 12, verses 2 and 3 for a final point. Hebrews 12, verses 2 and 3, the Bible tells us here, in verse number 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured. There's the word endured. Jesus is the greatest example of endurance. He is the greatest example of finishing that faith. Looked, uh, the Bible says, before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I'll throw verse 3 in there. For consider Him who endured such hostility for sinners against Himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. So he says we will get weary, we will get discouraged, even deep down in our souls, if we are not looking unto Jesus. And so here's the points that, that we have considered, and we'll develop that, third, or that last point a little more. Number one is we are to run in the footsteps of those who came before us, that great cloud of witnesses. We are to run as much as possible, weight free, casting our cares on God, for He cares for us. We are to run a race of endurance. And lastly, we are to run the race looking unto Jesus. I don't know how we finish a race if we never believe there is a finish line in sight. I don't know how we ever run a race without having to focus on something. Shifting the analogy a little bit, you know, uh, a tight roper, I am told, is able to balance on that extremely thin place their feet are stationed upon because they look forward and they see a very specific point fixed ahead of them and they focus so intently on that that the waving and the cheering of the crowd and the other things below are not distracting them. Focusing on Jesus will keep us focused and not distracted. It will help us not to lose focus. It will help us to stay on the path. Here's another passage that comes to mind in Matthew chapter 13. You don't have to go there, Kim, because I think we're all familiar with this story. But in Matthew 13, the disciples are in a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and they look out at night and they see something that they, they're scared by a little bit and they say, is that a ghost? Jesus gets closer and they say, and they realize it's Jesus. And when they see that Jesus is approaching them, they see He's not in a boat, He's not on a raft, He's not on any floating uh, device. He's simply walking to them on the water. And these, many of them are fishermen. They knew this sea. They grew up on this sea. They knew that was physically impossible. 
So what they saw was supernatural. It was a miracle. And they had known Jesus to expect miracles of Jesus. And in a moment of courage, it was Simon Peter who speaks up. And in that moment of courage, he says, Lord, command me to come to you out on the water. I read that and here's my thought. Be, be careful what you ask of the Lord. Because when he says, Lord, command me, and maybe this is a little bit to do with our English wording, but it's a point nonetheless. When he says, command me to come to you out on the water, you remember when you read the text, Jesus has one word. He says, come. Anything Peter did that was in defiance of walking on that water after that would have been disobedience. Jesus said, come. Well, he had the courage and he put a foot outside of that boat and he put another foot outside of that boat and for a moment in time, Peter was the other man who walked on water. I had a sermon. It's one of the last sermons I preached before moving here. thought about using it but never really got to it. The other man who walked on the water. And I'm telling you, Peter deserves credit for also walking on the water. And Peter had the faith to walk on the water and the obedience to honor the command to come out on the water. And as long as his focus was fixed on Jesus, he was walking on the water. But you remember the story is told in this fashion that the winds were heavy and the, and the rain, or the, the winds and the waves were heavy. And as he began to lose focus on his north star, literally Jesus Christ, he saw the turbulence around him. And when he saw the turbulence around him. He lost focus. His faith grew weaker. He began to sink. And so the problem on that day was simply not focusing on Jesus. But you remember what happens even when he had a weak moment, even when he lost focus on Jesus, who was it that was there to reach down and grab him up to safety? It was still Jesus. I don't care how far you have sunk, Jesus can reach down and grab you. I don't care how far you have fallen or drifted away. Jesus still wants you back and will bring you back if you want Him to. There are members of our congregation who have become unfaithful. Reach out and try to win them back. Always, with every individual that comes to mind when we make that statement, Jesus can and will bring them back. Let me leave you with this last passage and then we'll call it a lesson. It is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 7. Listen, I'm leaving after four years of working with you guys and I love this experience and love our relationship and fully plan to see most of you, if not all of you, again in the future. I already have plans of being here for standing in the gap coming up, although I will not be able to be here for that Sunday. I'll get to see hopefully all, most of our men. If we're ever going to the beach, we will find a beach that puts us coming this direction to give us an excuse to stop here off of 75. I grew up right off Interstate 75, and, and this is an easy place to stop and see people at. If you're ever in the Smoky Mountains, please come and see us. So I'm not leaving for good. You, if you care anything about us like we do, many of you, uh, we want to see you again. Uh, if you're in that area, come and see us. The Eastside Church of Christ in Maryville is where we're going to be, 30 minutes or so from the Smokies. Uh, there in Pigeon Forge and all of that. Come and visit us. Or call us and visit us at our home in Knoxville. Let me say this. I'm not dying. But Paul was about to die when he wrote these words. These were among the last things that Paul wrote before his life would be taken. And he wrote them to a young man that he had been instrumental in teaching. And as he's writing to this young man, Timothy, in 2 Timothy 4 and verse number 7, I want you to notice what he says to this young servant of Christ. He says, 2 Timothy 4, 7, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the what? The race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also for all who love His appearing. I plan on seeing as many people in this room and many of our members who are sick or many of them are traveling this Sunday. I plan on seeing you again. But if the next time we see each other is in that beautiful home in, uh, above, I hope that we can all sit there and say, we really did fight the good fight, didn't we? We really did finish the race, didn't we? 
We really did anticipate and love the coming of the Lord, and we're able to be here and talk in this fashion now. The, that only happens if we finish the race. That only happens if we stay on course. That only happens if we continue to pursue God and live for Jesus in every avenue of our lives. And if you know someone who's not doing that, you reach out with desperation to them and beg them to come back to the Lord. If you're here this morning and want to follow Jesus and want to be, uh, make Him a priority in your life, make Him the Lord of your life, here's the good news. If you make Him the Lord of your life, He'll be the Savior. Will you come and follow Him as we stand and as we sing? <clears throat> Lord.